Life Audio. Hey, welcome to Gospel Rants, very special Valentine's Day three-part series on love. We're calling it What's Love Got to Do With It from Tina Turner's 1984 song. I'm Dr. Bill Sinyard with Gospel App Ministries, gospel-app.com. Oh my goodness, <laughs> so much in, in just three podcasts. Nothing has hurt us more than relationships. So love or lack of love or fear of love, bad love, unrequited love. And we Christians are supposed to be, (laughs) we're supposed to be the love experts. People should look at us and our loves and our actions, our emotions, and we should be easily identifiable as followers of Christ by our love, Jesus says. They'll know you're Christians by your love. Well, I mean, look around. How's that going for us? I think that we have gotten way too confused by the whole topic of love and romance and sex, relationships, it's unfortunate. Uh, Part of it, and I'm going to talk about it, you've heard the categories made popular by C.S. Lewis. By the way, I am a huge C.S. Lewis fan. Uh, uh, Top two or three books in my list are C.S. Lewis's. I am, by the way, I'm writing a new book for teens, for tweens, modeled after the Chronicles of Narnia, a modernized version. It's called The Unlikely Prince. If you're interested in coming alongside that project, I need all the help I can get to get it out there. Let me know, bill at gospel-app.com. Thanks ahead of time. So per C.S. Lewis, there was agape, which is God's love, then phileo, which is a love between friends, then eros. Yeah, you know what that is. But are those categories right? I don't think so. And I'm going to show you that it's very confusing in so many ways and not biblical on its face. Um, uh, No disrespect meant to to, uh, C.S. Lewis. But listen, how many times do you think that the Greek word eros is used in the Bible? It's it's that important, right? Uh, The Greek New Testament or the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, Uh, How many times do you think Eros is used? Go ahead and guess. I'm going to give you the answer in podcast number three. Look, we have a love and being loved crisis on our hands here in the West. Uh, That's Christian and non-Christian. It's a human thing. Loneliness, depression, anxiety through the roof, divorces, broken marriages, way too high. Uh, No no judgment. (laughs) Happy Valentine's Day. (laughs) But this series should be super good news for people who long for more, who've been hurt by relationship and by love, and are wondering, is there love out there for me? Am I lovable? And we all know those people, and they're wondering about love and lovability, and is there anyone out there for me? And listen, I've got your back. This series is for you. Uh, it's really, really good news. And for listen, if you're listening to this series, you and the Holy Spirit brings to mind some people, get it to them. They, they, they will thank you. Post it on your Facebook, your Twitter, email, Instagram, right? Send it to friends, to families. Just, just, just do it, please. I'm begging you. All right. So here's Tina Turner. You must understand how the touch of your hand. You were hoping I was going to sing it. Oh, no, you don't want that. Here we go. You must understand how the touch of your hand makes my pulse react that it's only the thrill of boy meeting girl opposites attract. It's physical, only logical. You must try to ignore that it means more than that. Oh, oh, what's love got to do with it? Got to do with it. What's love but a secondhand emotion? What's love got to do? Got to do with it. Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Oh my goodness. Great song. Still a classic, even after almost 40 years now. And you might know the history. Dark Cloud surrounded that song. We now know that she had divorced her husband, Agent Ike, after a horrific, abusive relationship that led to depression, suicide ideation for Tina. Look, this stuff, the struggle was lo- was real to her. Love is dangerous, right? And we all felt that a little. I mean, if you've been through adolescence, you have. Nothing has hurt us more than relationships and so this was a real question, which he sang the song, and it resonated with a huge population, particularly young women, who culturally 
uh, you know, had real issues being objectified and used and uh, in a very patriarchal society. I mean, all the things we talk about today, that was just when that was being formed. She was not alone then. She's not alone now. So love, what has it got to do with it? Three-part podcast. It's going to be lots of fun. I guess I'm starting off a little heavy. Don't mean to. And it's going to include stuff that you likely don't know. Make sure, again, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, help us get the words out. I want to thank you ahead of time. Think of that person who's hurting, particularly on Valentine's Day. So this podcast, we're going to look at the brain, neuroscience of love. I mean, who does that? So those who still think that love is a choice, and that's the popularized statement out there. There's an unreal number of people who use that phrase. God bless them. But I think, unfortunately, that phrase is used far too loosely and has led to great misconceptions and damage and broken relationships. I mean, if that's you, uh, you know, this could be a little hard for you to hear. And I, by the way, I understand what is meant. They're saying that love is not just a feeling, it's but intentional actions, taking responsibility towards the other. That's that's great. And I agree with that. But is that what is really being communicated? And you'll see what I mean. A lot. And I mean, a lot of love is subconscious and not a choice. It's brain science. It's neuroscience. Uh, we are responsible for our actions. But in a real sense, much of love and the feeling of love and being in love or falling out of love is not my fault. It's, it's my brain. And that's the neuroscience of love and sex and codependency and addiction. Is it love if you're addicted to another person? Is it love if you're enmeshed so you've lost your sense of self? And can you actually choose to get out of it? We're going to talk about that in this podcast. So in the big picture, why the big deal? Right? I mean, the entire Bible, the message of the Bible, revelation is summed up as love God and love others. And yet, what do we struggle with the most? Loving God and loving others and loving ourselves. So we're going to be talking about that amazing, ridiculous good news in the third podcast, how we can take baby steps toward really, really getting there uh, a little bit this side of heaven. So that's this podcast on neuroscience. In the next podcast, we're going to look at some of the interesting history of how people, ancients, looked at love and tried to explain love. The Romans were afraid of it. They actually passed laws to legislate it. Yeah, funny story. How'd that go for them? And this was the stuff that Paul walked into in his missionary journeys. We'll talk a little bit about that. And yet, we inherit so much of our misunderstanding of love from them. Uh, you may be shocked. And lastly, in the third podcast, we're going to look at God's love. This is the really, really, really good stuff. Uh, I think it falls off the table. It's too bad. It's a high bar. There's so many misunderstandings, right? I get back to it. God's love is agape, right? And so what then is eros and phileo? Uh, so whatever you think all of those mean, um, all of that's popular, popularized, but it falls short of, uh, of the biblical directions. Oh, by the way, and along the way, we're going to speak about sex and codependency and addiction. My hope is that on this short journey, we're going to, each of us, veer towards the experience more and more of a, the unique, unique, transforming love of God. Not a bumper sticker, the real stuff. Not to the exclusion of love from, from other human beings. Those That's very, very important. But shifting from needing the love from other human beings to appreciating love from other humans. And we humans are created to long for, to jones after real love, but we're created to get that love first and foremost from God. And we've just gotten confused by the buffet of things out there called love. Uh, again, we're going to try to cover some of that. Ready to get going? Good. But first, a word from our Valentine's Day sponsors. We'll see you in a moment. If you've been thinking about retirement communities but have questions about how it all works, help is here. At Country Meadows, we are happy to answer the questions you may have about senior living, like what social activities take place in typical communities, or what are the different levels of memory care. To get answers, you can visit our website resource center, which has articles and videos on dozens of topics available, or speak to one of our advisors directly. It's all free and with no obligation, so ask away. Country Meadows, here to help. I'm Don Hawkins, and I once heard Chick-fil-A founder Truett Cathy say, you can tell if a person needs encouragement, check to see if they're breathing. 
I'd like to invite you to my weekly podcast, Encouragement for You, featuring encouraging guests like Dr. Greg and Aaron Smalley, Dan Cathy, the late Dr. Frank Menrith, Josh McDowell, and more. To subscribe to my weekly Encouragement for You podcast, go to lifeaudio.com. That's lifeaudio.com. All right, welcome back. The Brain, <clears throat> a little review. Gross oversimplification, but we're going to divide the brain functionally into two parts, the rational and the emotional. The rational frontal lobe with its prefrontal cortex, it oversees being reasonable, thinking, um, considering things strategically, making choices. This is where the will is theologically it's being able to imagine long-term consequences of decisions. So if you're a Star Trek fan, think Mr. Spock, right? The rational Vulcan who struggles to control uh, his human emotions. If you could, if you really could just choose to love, that would be the place to do it in your prefrontal cortex. It's the part of the brain that asks the questions, is, is that a good idea? So it's important, uh, and we need to be using it more and developing it. And, and our prefrontal cortex, this is interesting, is not fully mature and online until we're in our 20s. Very interesting. So that explains a great deal of teen behavior and why teens take risk and make decisions that seem irresponsible. Because in some ways, it's because their prefrontal cortex is not mature. And they're, it's not quite online. Uh, the teenage years is not a good time to make life decisions. And it's not all their fault. Uh, by the way, a plug for good enough parent, our new online program. If you are hearing this and you are a frustrated parent of teens and tweens, or you know a parent of teens and tweens, please check out our free online resource for you. It's called Good Enough Parent. Uh, that's from a uh, attachment theory concept that if you have an infant and three out of 10 of the interactions with your infant are actually attuning, we can talk about that some other time, if they, if if three out of ten, not nine out of ten, but three out of ten, then the child will enter their next stage of life as more secure, uh, and that's important. So, good enough parent. How can I be a good enough parent? The three out of ten, intimate, attuning interactions with my child. That's what they're looking for, by the way. And so, we give you fifteen free, short, I think ten minutes online tips. They're sent to you one a day for fifteen days. And parents, you'll learn about your teen's brain more than maybe you want to know, and, and your own brain, and why they're not being reasonable, the subconscious two questions that they're asking, and by the way, what the right answers are, why they emotionally blow up. But here's the beginning of the clue. Their prefrontal cortex is not online. If you're trying to be reasonable with them, good luck. Uh, so check it out, www.goodenoughparent, all one word, goodenoughparent.online. Totally free. All right, back to our Valentine's Day podcast. So uh, that's the rational part of the brain. Then there's the emotional part of the brain. Very powerful midbrain limbic system with the amygdala where we get the fear cycles, hippocampus where memories are stored alongside of emotions that you felt, the hypothalamus, the nucleus accumbens, which is the brain's pleasure center. The limbic system controls the experience and expression of emotions all autonomic, all automatic, meaning you can't control it by your prefrontal cortex. Forget the choice. It's responsible all behind the scenes, largely for emotions such as fear, anger, pleasure, sadness. Again, just choose to stop any of those. It, it drives behavior with or without your rational brain's participation in areas such as sex, your experience of sex, emotional dysregulation when you blow up, and love. So, you know, the time when you blew up out of control, it likely wasn't a choice you made to blow up. You are responsible, but it wasn't all your fault, meaning it was a part of your brain that you have very, very little control over. So when people begin to fall in love, their brains become active in a couple of key regions. These are the same areas that become active with other things like sex and food and drugs and music, right? Sex, drugs, rock and roll. In brain scans, these areas light up when you're falling in love. Chemicals associated with the reward circuit flood your brain. They produce 
a variety of physical and emotional responses and, and light speed, by the way. So racing hearts, sweaty palms, flushed cheeks, feelings of passion and anxiety, a desire to, <laughs> to write horrible poetry, to text people 20 times a day. Look, it may sound strange, but the beginning of romantic love is associated with a stress response that's triggered by your hypothalamus. And you know that nervous excitement and anxiety you feel while you're falling for someone? During the initial stages of falling in love, your stress levels skyrocket. I mean, you've heard of cortisol, the stress hormone most familiar with the fight, flight, freeze cycles. Our body recognizes love as a crisis that must be managed. <laughs> oh, my goodness. As cortisol levels rise... The levels of the neurotransmitter serotonin become depleted. This leads to what one scholar refers to as the intrusive, maddening, preoccupying thoughts, hopes, and terrors of early love. <laughs> Not exactly a Hallmark card or a Disney Channel movie. It's two people who become OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, right? And it is a disorder. That's how your brain sees it. They, they can only focus on one person, one thing. You can't live that way. But tell that to people in love, right? And then as you fall more deeply in love, your brain becomes engorged in dopamine. This is the good stuff. Dopamine is associated with your body's reward system. This makes love a ridiculously desirable feeling. You get dope highs when there's other things, right? Like chocolate and jogging, but also cocaine, crystal meth. It's the brain chemical that uncontrolled will lead to addiction. It's good. I mean, you, you want it. Uh, life without dopamine is not a good thing. I'll say more. And that kicks off a bigger reward circuit. So the more you are with the other and talk to each other, the more pleasure your brain is experiencing. And your brain is linking being with the other with uh, this dopamine hit. And when you separate, you go through a bit of a withdrawal. Then that explains explain so much. The immediate pleasure, the euphoria goes away. You need a hit of something. And in one study, again, not Hallmark, male fruit flies who were separated from their female counterparts, they drank four times as much alcohol as fruit flies that were with female fruit flies. <laughs> How many times in weddings have you heard the words, you're like fruit flies, you're jonesing for each other, but that's what happens inside of our brain. In one study, participants were shown pictures of someone they were in love with, and then they were shown pictures of an acquaintance, a friend. When they were shown a picture of someone they loved, the participants had increased activity in the parts of the brain that are rich in dopamine. And there's more. The dopamine shuts down that part of your brain that's responsible for social judgment, right? So when you're in the throes of romantic love, the neural machinery responsible for being critical, for making reasonable assessments that says, is that such a good idea? Comes to a grinding halt for a while. There's a neural basis to the phrase that love is blind. And as romance grows, your brain releases even more chemicals. There's oxytocin, there's vasopressin, and these deepen your feelings of attachment. They make you feel closer to one another. Uh, by the way, little known fact, they actually cause you to like others around you less. So you love the person you're in love with more and you love the people around you less. Isn't that interesting? Not quite sure what to do with that. So anyway, you're inundated with feelings of contentment, calmness, security, all good. And it produces this internal desire for long-term monogamous relationship. This is how God made us. That's science speak for faithfulness. Oxytocin is often referred to as the love hormone. Why? Because it increases when you hug someone or have an orgasm. It's produced in the hypothalamus, released through the pituitary gland. It helps couples relationally bond. Again, gift of God. Oxytocin helps build trust. It deepens relationships right? So isn't this fascinating? In this segment, I haven't mentioned prefrontal cortex much. All of this is happening behind its scene, beneath the sheet, so to speak. Your brain is subconsciously falling in love. Falling in love. That's a phrase we use 
to describe all of these chemical reactions, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, all of those things are doing something in your brain and causing you to feel something, and it's inexplicable from your prefrontal cortex, so we use the phrase, I'm falling in love. I mean, again, it's, it's also not a function of the person's attractiveness or whether they're smart or fun to be with or how they treat you. Uh, how, all of those things are important, perhaps. Um, all in context and culturally driven, whether you feel safe or feel loved. But honestly, it's your brain and brain chemicals kicking off when you're in a relationship. You become addicted to this this person, this particular person. It's what God does. It, it's, it's a gift. Um, and there is some love blindness. Have you ever been in a relationship where your family and friends are or raising red flags, but your brain is going, yep, oh, green light, green light, green light. It's, it's not that you're, you've gone stupid. You're just awash with some amazing drugs in your brain and your prefrontal cortex, eh, it's offline. The part of your brain where you are reasonable, you think long-term consequences, honestly, it's just temporarily shut down or certainly reduced by the brain chemicals from your midbrain. And also, uh, noroepinephrine spikes which makes you lose track of time. Doesn't that explain so much? It's a rise of adrenaline, which ex- which expands the capillary in your cheeks and make you flush, right? Uh, here's a quote. Meanwhile, our levels of serotonin, the key hormone in regulating appetite and intrusive anxious thoughts reduces. So when we're in love, we might find ourselves eating irregularly or fixating on small details, worrying about sending the perfect text, saying the perfect words, and then replaying the text or the phone call over and over again in our heads. Then we start feeling a deep sense of calm and contentment with our partner. Brain areas are activated that trigger not just basic emotions, but also more complex cognitive functions. This can lead to several positive results like pain suppression, more compassion, better memory, and greater creativity. Romantic love feels like a superpower that makes the brain thrive, close quote. Here's another quote. When we're falling in love with someone, the first thing we notice is how good it feels. It's because the brain releases the feel-good neurotransmitters that boost our mood. And when we find love, it's like biological fireworks. Whew, I need to take a break. Uh, You know, go get a cold shower. So this would be a good time for a word from our sponsors. It's a crazy world out there, moms and dads, and raising our kids to stand strong in the faith is tough. I'm Katherine Seegers, host of Christian Parent Crazy World, a podcast that answers the questions that keep us parents up at night. Questions like, um, is it okay to question God and the Christian faith? How do I help my kids to have an authentic faith? Wait wait a second. Is the Bible just a book written by some ancient dead guys? <laughs> yeah. For answers to these questions and more, subscribe to Christian Parent Crazy World at lifeaudio.com. Hello, my name's Rachel Carmen, and I want to invite you to come over and listen to my podcast. It's called Real Refreshment. For years and years as a young mother, I chased after the wind, thinking that the world could offer me the refreshment I longed for. But it was only when I discovered it in the person of Jesus Christ that I really found refreshment. Come on over and join me as we dig into Bible study. I'll see you there. All right, welcome back. I hope this has been interesting to you and helpful. Uh, Here are some bad Valentine's Day cards. Roses are red, violets are blue, you cause oxytocin to erupt in my nucleus accumbens too. Huh? All right, I should copyright it. Uh, Here's an actual popular card. I met you, I like you, I love you, I'm keeping you. But neuroscientifically, we could rewrite that. I met you, my brain released dopamine, it felt good, I want more. Happy Valentine's. Oh my goodness. More seriously, here's Tina Turner again, the second verse of what's love got to do with it. You get a sense of her hurt, right? Here it is. It may seem to you that I'm acting confused when you're close to me. If I tend to look dazed, I've read it someplace, I've got cause to be. There's a name for it. There's a phrase that fits, but whatever the reason, you do it for me. Oh, what's love got to do with it? What's love but a secondhand emotion? What's love got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? 
All right, uh, how about sex? During sexual arousal, notice how I sort of bled into that. During sexual arousal, our prefrontal cortex, again, that area we think, we're being reasonable, it shuts down, it's gone. Our subconscious midbrain activates light speed. We're, we're driven by emotion and uh, instinct rather than rational thought. It's, it's not exactly the stuff of Valentine's Day. Oxytocin levels dramatically increase during arousal, uh, and in particular, orgasm for women in particular, but when men as well. There is some research that oxytocin uh, released at orgasm makes women feel more connected to their partner. Um, and by the way, that's a danger of, of, uh, of, of premarital sex and, and, and so forth. So here's where addiction enters our picture. I need to say something about addiction. And while all those brain chemicals are great, it's brain's release of dopamine that is just is also wonderful and exciting. But it, dopamine is, is the root of all addictions, by the way. Addicts are not addicted to heroin or cocaine or nicotine or sex. They're addicted to dopamine that hits their brain that's being manipulated by the drug or the behavior. Uh, here's an expert. People in love often feel a sense of euphoria, the giddy excitement that you feel when you're spending time with a person or, or people you love. This can be traced to the effect of the release of the neurotransmitter dopamine. Just by thinking about someone you love is enough to trigger dopamine release, making you feel excited and eager to do whatever it takes to see them. This dopamine creates the attachment or addiction one feels to their partner or romantic interest. So, the two lovebirds are technically addicted to each other. This is not a bad addiction. Not all addictions are bad. It's how your brain's created. So they're addicts to that pleasure from a neuroscientific point of view in the same regions of their brain that people become addicted to alcohol, cigarettes, crack cocaine, heroin, and so forth. There are cravings, withdrawal symptoms, cross-dependence upon other drugs and medications. There's enabling, there's triggers, relapses, <laughs> loss of ability to think clearly or communicate. The, these two people are not emotionally stupid, but Narcan and methadone, just not going to help. I mean, I, I tell people, we just have to marry them. Uh, I told one couple at a marriage that I officiated, in one sense, this is an intervention. We, your friends and family, have seen all the signs of addiction, the glazed, confused look in your eyes, the reduced level of performance, your inability to shake it. You can't be reasonable at all, so we're here for you, <laughs> right? So no known cure, just go for it, do the best you can. And the good news and bad news is that like all addictions, the initial overwhelming effects wear off, they stabilize eventually, the crisis stress of the romance typically goes back to normal in one to two years. The brain areas associated with reward and pleasure can still be activated, thank God, after those two years, but it requires work. Um, the constant craving, the OCD, the withdrawals, and uncontrollable drooling, it actually becomes more manageable, um, more status quo. That dazed look in your eye tends to go away. You realize you've been in a coma for a few years and that there are other people around you. Uh, you get back to work. Um, it could go bad. Codependence, uh, that's an addiction to people and relationships. Partners can become so enmeshed in that addiction that they lose their own personal identities. There's no satisfaction there. There's no joy there. That's not a good thing. And, and your brain can be still ignited after that one to two years, but it takes effort and work. And that's what the love is a choice people are talking about. It just gets confused. So what do you do? Communication, openness, vulnerability, understanding, dating, all those things are good in most cases. Counseling, very helpful. Um, but look, Oh, and, and the midbrain stuff can be often relit by, by touching, by intimacy from, from many, uh, not, not across the board. By the way, did you know that men's midbrains are lit up by a few things, right? <laughs> but the, and the number one thing is not what you've been told. For men, the number one thing that lights up that area of our brain uh, for dopamine and so forth is respect, and being honored. Did you know that? And by the way, many women too, It being honored is a huge aphrodisiac for men's brains. 
All right, sex, close second. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, do both, do both. And by the way, women too. But honestly, there are a lot of couples who do all of that and still struggle. Uh, we've been beat up. Nothing has hurt us more than relationship. Heaven's going to be great. And this ain't heaven. So, look, we all come to relationships, hidden wounds, histories of abuse, disrespect, bad love, broken love, heartbreaks, you know, the bad things that fight against your present ability to be feel safe, to experience passionate intimacy, old mommy and daddy wounds, old sex wounds, all of those things. And we bring that to the relationships and it's in our hippocampus stored with the emotion and it causes boundaries, right? It causes uh, resistance to, uh, to the dopamine. And look, all I'm saying is that for Christians, so let me speak to the Christians in the audience. God has given us something more, something bigger, something uh, that pushes against that, something that a love that does not dissipate. It's always there. It's accessible. It loves you no matter who you are, how attractive you think you are, worthy or lovable you think you are, or what you've done or what's been done to you, or the wounds, all of those things. It's it, love does not question any of those things. It just reaches out. And that's what Paul is writing about in Ephesians. I'm going to read it. He was telling the Ephesians, all of them, the good ones, the bad ones, the ones who are struggling with faith, the ones who are in adulterous affairs, the ones who've been abused, the unloved, and not just on Valentine's Day, but 24-7, he's saying that there is a power from God. That's important. A power. Two Greek words he uses in this section. And and you get it through the spirit in your inner being. All Christians have the spirit in our inner being. And we can ask for it. And he, the spirit makes us experience. The power makes us experience a little or a lot, the height and width and length and depth of the love of Christ, not only for ourselves, but for each other. And that would include uh, our lover. Uh, Paul is modeling how we access it. We ask. Ephesians 3, 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray, I ask, right, that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power, that's reference number one to power, through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, And I, which basically means that you know you're a Christian. You're feeling um, uh, combined with Jesus, union with Jesus. You're feeling loved by Jesus, his embrace. And I pray, verse 17, that you being rooted and established in that love may have power, second reference, together with all the saints to grasp, I mean, to cling to, to grab a piece, to experience a little how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And, and that love of Christ is for you and for, for other people. This is the, the love that should mark us. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. For those who have been emptied by love and relationships, here's a place to get your cup filled. It's for Christians. Uh, he's modeling how you can begin to experience it in this Valentine season. He asks for power from God. Now, have you ever heard that you're invited to, uh, commanded to ask for power from God before you can experience the love of Christ? Let me unpack that. It's the best news this Valentine's Day. And please, Again, helping get this to friends and families who've been hurt by love, by breakups, by disappointment, by abuse, uh, by uh, particularly if they're feeling if they're not feeling God's love for them, they feel like they're a disappointment from God too. They feel ashamed. They stop going to church. Maybe pass this on to them. Um, you know, we can change the feel of Christianity with this stuff, one needy person at a time. And here it is: we can't experience a single love of Christ. And I'm going to spend some in the entire third podcast on what that love of Christ is and what it should feel like. We can't experience it unless the power of God makes us grasp it first. I mean, it's ours. Jesus paid for it 2,000 years ago. We can't add to it or take away from it, right? But we struggle to experience it. Why? Because of everything I've talked about, our midbrain has its own brain and is powerfully programmed from the hundreds or thousands of relational disappointments and failures it's programmed to get dopamine from, unfortunately, very addicted, addictive other loves. Some good, some bad, some destructive, but available. Our midbrain is not being reasonable. It's not considering my well-being. It just wants that pleasurable feeling from dopamine. And it's not able to distinguish between good love and bad love. That's the prefrontal cortex. There's a struggle there, right? That's how we're created. Why is the struggle there? Because... 
We've been created to depend upon God, to, to, to distinguish these things, to source that love for us. So the Holy Spirit, God, and all Christians can distinguish and can give us access to the power of God to not only distinguish good and bad, but begin to experience this love. And by the way, human lovers, if I'm experiencing this power and subsequently really experiencing the love of Christ a little, one of the things you get is you don't need love from others as much, right? Uh, and you're, you're not as desperate to relieve the pain of the emptiness and loneliness as much because your cup's filled a little bit. Your midbrain won't rapidly pursue other loves and sometimes destructive ones. Now, you can still appreciate love from other humans as, as much or even more, you just don't need it. You can be vulnerable. You can be safe. You can be more open. You can love others more. Uh, John Calvin wrote about the Holy Spirit's secret passion to make us feel the love of God for ourselves and others. Um, here's what he said, and I'm going to interpret it a little bit. In fine, the Holy Spirit is described to us as a fountain. That meant a lot in a semi-arid desert. Whence all heavenly riches flow to us, or as the hand by which God exerts his power, because by the... His divine inspiration, that's the Holy Spirit, he so breathes divine life into us. That's got to be good. So that we're no longer acted upon by ourselves. Think midbrain. My midbrain is not as in control, uh, but ruled by his motion and agency so that everything good in us is the fruit of his grace. While on our own endowments without him are mere darkness of mind and perverseness of heart. So the Holy Spirit can actually lead us to this love that brings us life and joy and dopamine and oxytocin, uh, not in destructive using relationships, not codependency. Okay? Um, until the Holy Spirit is doing that thing in me, I am an addict jonesing for love in all the wrong places, and and... I'm unprepared to feel it because nothing has been more harmful to me. So my brain is in that cycle. It wants, no, it needs to feel love and worthy of love, but it can't let the walls down. So I end up using and being used, getting greater, looking for greater highs. I'm an addict. And that's a good day. <laughs> Can we become addicted to the love of Christ? Or technically the dopamine in our brain as we experience the power of God through the Spirit in our inner being and the height and width and length and depth of the love of Christ. Yeah, that's exactly how God made our brain, to be addicted to his love, uh, right? Um, instead of focusing on choosing to love, I think a better book would be choosing to ask for God's power, his power, that makes me, makes me experience that love. Have you ever heard that? So anyway, this Valentine's Day, I'm begging you to stop relying on your own choice about love, your own abilities, actions, sexiness, all of those things, or lack of all of those things, and begin to actively, with great humility, empty hands, ask God for his power, and then depend upon that power to experience his love. And here's what that looks like. Friend, uh, partner, you wake up, you're Getting ready, you remember, you bow your head and say to the Spirit, give me access to God's power so that I can begin to grasp your love for me and for Pookie Bear. Uh, I need it. They deserve it. Uh, love googly goo through me so much that they feel it. You know what I mean? Uh, and God made our brain. This is such good news to thrive in the chemical wash of loving and being loved. It's a gift of his. It's what Adam and Eve experienced purely pre-fall. We can experience it a little bit through the uh, Holy Spirit. It's largely out of control of our rational brain. We choose to ask. That's that's our prime role. Um, but it, it's, it's supposed to be out of control. I mean, who wants love to be under the control of our prefrontal cortex? Think Spock again, boring and awkward and unsatisfying. We want that freedom of losing some control, but in a safe place with the right love. Um, right? Pre-fall Adam and Eve didn't need to be concerned about it. We do. Nothing has hurt us more relationships gone bad. Our brain's amygdala is designed to protect us, throws us into fight, flight, and freeze cycles. Hurtful memories are stored in the hippocampus. So when someone gets close, man, we're ready to trigger. That's boundaries and walls and inner working models that are fragmented. And they rob us of some of the intimate experience that God designed for us. We have fear. We got shame. We got baggage. We got identity issues, sexuality issues. Heaven's going to be great. We're going to feel the whole thing. And now we limp along. 
the best strategy, biblical, is to keep asking God for that power and wisdom, by the way. Um, and you'll see what we mean in by the third podcast. Um, one of the things is this. The love of Christ is powerful enough to make me feel really loved and intimate a little more than I did yesterday. It's highly addictive and worth pursuing. And by the way, it is pursuing me. I'm going to say more. But this Valentine's, know this, there is a love that can be trusted, that is safe, that heals wounds. It can make you feel adored, worthy, special, safe. This love will re- will also release dopamine, a feel-good chemical. God made you that way. Expect it. So I'm suggesting that it also releases oxytocin, the bonding chemical that makes you feel more bonded to God. Again, that's how your brain is made. And I can't prove that, but I can't imagine it's not true. You leave feeling this power of God's love more honored, adored, and related to God. It's as if your midbrain heard, you are my beloved son or daughter with whom I am well pleased. That's the love of Christ. If you're a Christian, it was purchased for you 2,000 years ago, and it represents all the love in the universe. And it's all for you, no matter what. So just ask. So roses are red, <clears throat> violets are blue. God, give me power to overcome all of my hurts, wounds, fears, and doubts, and make me feel your love now quick before I go and do something stupid too. All right, I need an editor. Sorry for the bad meter. Ephesians 3, 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, that's the third reference of power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Before I leave, I want to give you some fun homework, a couple of love songs uh, that I think if you just meditate on these, you'll get the idea. The first one is my favorite. uh, Oh my gosh, Gyra. Elevation Worship, Maverick City. Do the long play on YouTube. Sit back, close your eyes. Listen to this. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up. So there's nothing I can do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. Oh my goodness, just goes on and on. Just let it wash over you. But here's a sneaky number two. Adele's Make You Feel My Love. It is a secular song, but the imagery is very Jesus. So imagine it's Jesus singing this to you. And let me know what happens. Um, Bill at gospel-app.com. And here's here's a a bit. When the rain is blowing in your face and the world is on your case, the whole world is on your case, I could offer you a warm embrace to make you feel my love. When the evening shadows and the stars appear and there is no one there to dry your tears, I could hold you for a million years to make you feel my love. By the way, Jesus will hold me for more than a million years. And that's what Paul is saying. I need God's love to make me feel his love. Uh, Choices to ask. I need God to actually make me feel his love because my midbrain is so broken. Jesus paid for that 2,000 years ago. And most Christians, we struggle to feel it. All right. Thanks to lifeaudio.com for their platform and assistance in this series. Next time, we're going to look at the history of love. Like I said, the Romans were scared to death of the thing. Uh, Why? Well, check it out. In the meantime, do me a favor. Like this podcast on whatever platform you choose. Follow us. Put it on Facebook, Twitter. Send it to friends uh, that you that the Holy Spirit brings to mind. They will, they will, they will be glad you did. Um, you may even help, may even, even save some struggling marriages and, and relationships. Leave a comment on your podcast platform or let me know what you think directly. Bill at gospel-app.com. Calm. Happy Valentine's Day. Take heart, child of God. Our world can feel chaotic and uncertain, but we don't have to live enslaved to fear. Christ has promised you and I his peace, and throughout scripture, he has provided powerful truths and practical steps to help us experience greater freedom. I'm Jennifer Slattery, lead host of the Faith Over Fear podcast, inviting you to join me and my team as together we learn how to starve our fears and grow our faith. Subscribe at lifeaudio.com. Do you ever hear sayings make their way through the culture and the church that seem nice in theory, but are actually theologically problematic? My name is Shara Donahue, and I'm the host of The Bible Never Said That, a podcast where we examine these popular sayings under the lens of biblical truth. We cover sayings like, God won't give you more than you can handle, time heals all wounds, and follow your heart. We also spend time exploring how people use Bible verses out of context. If you want to grow in discernment and truth, join us and subscribe at lifeaudio.com.